Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. When you consider hunger in Wyoming, the numbers are staggering. 70,000 Wyomingites aren't entirely sure where all their food is gonna come from this week. We visit with First Lady Jenny Gordon on the First Lady's Wyoming Hunger Initiative and also with Jamie Purcell, the Executive Director of the Food for Thought Project and the great work that her organization does. Hunger in Wyoming, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. I'm Jenny Gordon. Over 71,000 of our neighbors in Wyoming struggle with food insecurity. About 23,000 of them are kids, nearly enough to fill War Memorial Stadium. That isn't okay with me. Wyoming Hunger Initiative will work with school districts, communities, and organizations across the state to combat this challenge. I hope you'll join me with your time, your generosity, and your innovative thinking. No child in Wyoming should ever go hungry. Childhood hunger is a problem that can be solved together. And as we continue on Wyoming Chronicle today, it's our privilege to be joined by the First Lady of the State of Wyoming, Jenny Gordon. Mrs. Gordon, welcome. And with Jamie Purcell, the Executive Director of the Food for Thought Project here in Casper. Jamie, thank you very much. We're in your beautiful garden, and we're going to get to the great work that you do here in just a minute. But I want to start with the First Lady. We just saw a, a small, brief introduction, really, uh, Mrs. Gordon, into in what it is that you're trying to do. And I'll say right off the bat, I'm kind of sorry that we have to talk about hunger in Wyoming. Well, absolutely, I am too. And it's something that I learned about just a couple years ago um, it, during the campaign. And as I traveled around the state, I found more and more people were in need. So tell me about your initiative. Um, you, This isn't something that you hatched just in Cheyenne. You've been out and about all over Wyoming, seeing programs like what Jamie is, is doing here in Casper, but also seeing areas maybe where a lot needs to be done to help in hunger. And the statistics are just, they're just sad. Um, when, you talk, when you think that, you know, 23,000 kids in Wyoming really aren't sure where their next meal is coming from or where Saturday night's meal is coming from. Absolutely. What we have done with my office is to try to just travel around the state, understand what the needs are, and then get with the um, people who are doing the work on the ground, the partners that are already doing the work, to help to spotlight what they're doing, seeing what needs they have, if there's any way I could be of help but not reinvent the wheel because I think that there are already people, champions and heroes like Jamie doing the work. Give me an idea of the components of the program then. You obviously want to gather information, but um, as I understand it, there might be grants available to either help people start or maybe expand what it is that they're trying to help, you know, do to help with this problem. Absolutely, so I call it uh, aware, care and share. We just, first of all, need to make people aware if they aren't aware. And that is just getting the statistics out that um, about 23,000 children um, have food insecurity in Wyoming, almost 71,000 adults, if those were cities. Think about that. Yeah, if they were cities, 71,000. That would be the largest city in Wyoming. That's in our state, in yeah. our small state. Absolutely. So that's the awareness part. The, the caring part is most people, once they hear, they do care. But some people maybe need to understand why that's important. And because when people are hungry, they often have depression, anxiety. Children might have to repeat grades in school. It also affects their physical health um, with diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure. So it's something that once they understand why they should care or care, then I really want them to share, sure. share the story share their volunteer hours, and if they have extra share money to help these people in need. Before we continue on, um, what should someone do? If they're saying, you know, I know I have an issue in my community. Um, I'm not sure where to start. I'm, I have no idea to get to where you are, Jamie, um, with the great work that you're doing. How do you get from understanding the need to really making a difference? 
What should well, they do? Well, what we are going to launch is a website that is going to be nohungerwyo.org. And what we want to do on that website is to put people in touch with people such as Jamie who have already started a program. They don't have to reinvent the wheel again. They can contact peers and work one-on-one. -on -one. And I know Jamie has helped a lot of organizations throughout the state. I heard you speak at church um, a couple weeks ago, and that's how I learned the, about your, your initiative. What are people telling you about, you know what, you're right on, um, th this is an issue, or I didn't understand that it was an issue. Um, I didn't understand that we had that problem next door or, or right here in Wyoming. Absolutely. The number one thing they say is that they just were not aware and that they couldn't believe it would happen in, in our small state. Yeah. Jamie, you've been at this since 2012, the, the, food, the Wyoming Food for Thought Project. Right. Take me back a little bit before that. Why did you begin this? And then we'll get into it, what it is that you do. Um, I was working in hunger already and working in human services and I'd had a lot of experience working at the Boys and Girls Club and so at that point I had seen quite a bit of the issue of, that, um, of hunger, bringing kids um, who were coming home from school hungry even though they'd eaten lunch because the amount of food they were getting really wasn't that great. Um, so when I started Food for Thought, there was a food bag program in Casper, but it really was what I call at least. It really was only serving about 160 kids and the food that was going into the food bags wasn't really that kid friendly. It was much more intended for like assuming that the food was going to a house that might have a kitchen or extra ingredients to make it. So like they would send and this home. This was a school district was trying to do right, this. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. And you know, they just, I think oftentimes with schools, right? you're already doing so much and so to add one more thing they were well intentioned but they really needed help bolstering that program up so we came in and started that food bag program and committed to making sure that every single food bag had breakfast lunch and dinner for every day a kid was out of school we also committed to making sure that food was as friendly or kid friendly as possible easy to prepare shelf stable we never wanted to assume that that food bag was going home to a home that maybe had electricity or a functioning kitchen so all the things that we put in the food bag we wanted to do our best to make sure that um at the time my daughter was in kindergarten and so i looked at her and thought if she takes this bag of food home can she sustain herself over the weekend until she gets back to school and that's really where it started and you know since has grown exponentially but everything that we're doing in casper is really focused on that idea that we want kids and and in turn their families and the community to have good and healthy access to food all year round but it's it's it it seems to me it's a change it's a changing of the way we think about food that we don't just want to go to the store and grab the budget gourmet there are other ways that we can um, work together as a community to provide food right well Mrs. Gordon really touched on those statistics and I think that one of the reasons that we have such high statistics of hunger in Wyoming is because people make such broad assumptions, right? Well, why don't the kids' parents just go get another job? Why don't they just go to a community garden and pick food? And the, the problem with making those assumptions that everyone's life is the same as yours and so if they would just do X, Y, and Z then the problem would be solved is, is that this problem is so multifaceted and it's not just about not enough food at home, but it's about why is there not enough food at home? What are all of those issues contributing to the fact that there's not enough food at home? And so from our perspective at Food for Thought, we're really trying to look at our solution and what we're doing, not just from here's a bag of food, see you next week, even though that's what we call the Band-Aid, right? We're taking care of the immediate need, but we really want to work um, with our community. And by that, I mean everyone in the state that's working on this to address solutions that um, hopefully in time put us out of business because the issue is no longer there. Kenny, we were talking off camera about a 211 service. And I wanna talk about that briefly before we get back into just hunger alone. It's, um, it's a service that I think a lot of people aren't aware of, and me, me included. Absolutely, I met the 211 coordinator for the state in Laramie about three weeks ago. She approached me when I mentioned we were trying to get a database together with all the services that were provided for, for, for hunger. And she mentioned that this is a countrywide uh, number you can call and they have people that will triage all sorts of problems, whether it's your electricity is getting cut off or you need to find housing or you need to find food or mental health services. <clears throat> and certainly, You've seen the statistics 
hunger happens to be right near the top of why people call. Absolutely. She said top four reasons. And so, so even in Wyoming, people can call this number now and get connected and, and with what you're doing, maybe even have more resources at their disposal here soon. Absolutely, and they'll triage through to see if maybe you're a veteran. Um, you could get services through the Veterans Administration, or if you have a, a child that maybe has special needs or other um, facilities that they can refer you to. We're in a beautiful garden, and it hasn't frozen yet, which is awesome. <laughs> right. Tell me, tell me, what is this garden, um, Jamie? Um, what is it? How, how is it utilized? And, there are other gardens around Casper as well. Sure. Um, so one of the things that Food for Thought does is try and de demonstrate what can be done for a solution. So our three core um, pillars of uh, what we do are to provide, educate, and empower. So this community garden was the first one that we did. We now have over 200 community garden beds in Casper. Um, at this location, we have about 100. And so most of the garden beds that you see here are planted um, for the good of the community and anyone can come pick at any time. The intention with that, we call it food is free gardens, um, is to show people in our community, number one, that you can grow your own food. Um, number two, that um, uh, raspberry comes off of a plant that looks like that and this is when you pick it. And then number three, to create community around food and allow our neighbors to feel empowered and um, give dignity to food access and help them to understand that they too can do this maybe in their own apartment or their own yard, that there are ways to create upward mobility, um, many, many different ways, just like I was talking about those multifaceted pieces of hunger, there are many different ways you can address hunger. And one of those is just by planting a garden and sharing the produce with your community and your neighbors. One of the great things I, that, that I've learned about your program is you depend on volunteers. Mm -hmm. But those volunteers aren't just senior citizens. They might be young people working side by side with, with a senior citizen or, or an adult. And I think that's just fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, how does that work? And um, if, for people that are interested in volunteering, what should they do? Well, you know, not just for our organization, but I would recommend just like Mrs. Gordon has for any community, if you feel compelled to get involved, just pick up the phone or come down to wherever that place is and ask. Most food bag programs that I know of are really open to all ages, and it's really fun when you're packing those food bags to see the little, the littles with the retirees and all the ages and abilities in between. We've got folks that come from probation and parole and do their community service hours. We've got some developmentally disabled folks who come because um, for us, us, we really try again to make everything attainable to everyone if we can and so again you know it's welcoming it's community because I think another piece of this issue is you know it's not just one person doing one thing right it's all of us working together on multi levels um, to do this and so if you make that work attainable to everyone in one form or function then more gets done so you're serving thousands of people tell people how many are on your staff that are paid here <laughs> three Three people. Yes. And it, it's amazing the work you do. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's what's down the line. Mrs. Gordon, you talked about an interesting, um, something interesting to me when I heard you speak earlier about breakfast after the bell, which I thought was very interesting. You know, I, I've heard of um, free and reduced lunch programs offering maybe breakfast before school. But there's a stigma, too, for people that, oh, you're a breakfast kid, and I'm not. But there are ways that are being um, utilized to work around that problem. Absolutely. Our staff joined the Department of Education uh, earlier this year. We wrote a grant and received, uh, we were one of five states that received the grant for $50,000 to actually introduce breakfast into the classroom so the kids don't have to choose between getting off the bus and going to the playground and playing with their friends or going into the cafeteria, which oftentimes they would choose to play with their friends. Um, it's uh, it's been in the state for quite a few years. We were just up in Gillette. They have been doing it for 14 years, but more and more schools are coming on board and we're really excited to see those numbers increase. There are some great champions. I know um, Laramie County, the food service director there, Shannon Thompson Emsley, has, um, is willing to help any school district that wants to get it started because she knows the ins and outs. There are people, I'm sure not just children, that are trying to decide, should I go play with my friends or eat? Um, but there maybe are also adults who are watching right now. I don't know that I should make that call. But what encouragement would you give them to seek, to seek assistance? 
Well, I think, it, you know, if you don't, if you want to do it anonymously, I would call that 211 number. They could get you um, started and it would be something that, that would not be, it's very confidential. It wouldn't be something that people would know about. I think coming down, visiting your local, like Food for Thought or any of the other food banks, there's a lot of food pantries in the state and I think they're willing to help anyone and they're really removing barriers now. Instead of having you fill out a lot of forms, they just say, come in, let's talk about things and um, let's get you fed first. David, we were talking off camera about barriers. Yes. And some things that you would like to do. There's a really well-painted bus not far from where we're, <laughs> we're sitting today that you haven't been able to use. Right. Yeah, tell me about that issue. Well, um, so the Wyoming Food Freedom Act is a really great law. And in 2015, the first act that was passed had this uh, clause in it where I could be your designated agent. So Mrs. Gordon could say, go sell my beef for me, and I could go do that. Um, they took that clause out in 2017, and so now um, you as the producer are the only one who can sell your products unless it's been inspected. So that led us to um, recognize that there's a need in our community and in many communities for commercial processing facilities, for people to make their jams and jellies and salsas and things like that in a commercial kitchen and then be able to sell it beyond the farmer's market. Well, one of those issues is that most of the people who sell at the farmer's market, it's their side hustle or it's their retirement project. And so they don't necessarily need to go rent a kitchen for uh, six or months or a year on their own. And kitchens can be expensive. And so what we have done and what other communities are doing as well is we purchased a building with a commercial kitchen inside of it. And it will be a shared use commercial kitchen. So not only will we um, be able to fill our bus with commercially inspected products that we will then be able to drive around our community to places where people may not be able to make it to grocery stores or farmers markets, but um, we'll also be able to help our, our, our producers at our farmers markets be able to um, expand their businesses and perhaps even make it their full-time job if they would like for that to be. And we'll be able to start seeing more and more Wyoming products in grocery stores and other places, places that, um, you know, tout local and have local as in from Colorado or places like that. But our intention and with our partners around the state is to really create a stronger system of food foodpreneurs, we call them, entrepreneurs around okay. food that will be able to scale up in a manageable manner. You a gardener, Mrs. Gordon? I have been, but during the campaign, I did not plant a garden, so. It's One been... of the things I think that is interesting though, is that, and you, you touched on it earlier, Jamie, is that um, people can learn mm -hmm. to do this. Um, in our family, my wife definitely has the green thumb, but she's learned and, mm -hmm. and she's invested some time. Um, there are things like you can check out seeds from a library. Right. That was surprising to me. Tell me about that program. Yeah, there are many seed libraries around the state as well. We actually have a seed library here at Food for Thought, but um, the seed library is essentially a card catalog that instead of having cards in it, has seeds in it. And so if you want to plant eggplant or radishes, you go to your local seed library and you check out those seeds and you plant them. And then at the end of the season, you save some of those seeds and return them to the library for the next season. So it's a great program in that, um, again, it creates access. You don't have to go buy seeds, right? So you can check them out and that helps more people access more seeds. Um, it removes barriers like that. And then it also helps create those, those seeds become hardier to Wyoming season after season. So sometimes, you know, if you plant a garden and you have like two tomatoes germinate, you feel really bad. Well, those tomatoes might've been- Every now and then that happens to us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah that. It's because those seeds came from another state where those tomatoes weren't grown in Wyoming. And as we all know, Wyoming is very unique and it's why we love it. But you need to adapt. Um, you need to adapt the way you're growing or you need, your seeds need to adapt or you need to adapt the way you're feeding kids and how you're reaching them. And, you know, it all comes back to looking at what the problem is and how do we solve it in a very Wyoming way. You're initiating a capital campaign. Yes. Tell us about that. All right, so <laughs> circling back <laughs> to that kitchen. This is the kind kitchen. of what's next year, sure. <laughs> sure, yeah. So we have our 200 community garden beds. We have our weekend food bag program that we do year round. Um, we have a free store, which is like a thrift store that we give away things for free. Um, and, and next steps for us are um, coming back to that kitchen. Um, we bought a building with the kitchen in it. And so we're turning that building into what we call the good food hub. So it'll be 11,000 square feet of food processing, aggregation, on-site growing, um, a culinary training program, and then a marketplace. And we'll accept food stamps. Um, we're 
or dreaming of all the different things we'll be able to do there. But the intention is just to create a community around food and food access. All done. Um, Jenny by a lady who wanted to be an architect. <laughs> right? Right. Well, someone keeps telling me, I mean, we're still building. We're just absolutely. not building buildings. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So where do you see your initiative um, going and growing, um, Jenny? But um, obviously, we're just at the starting point now. Um, you have a, a lot of information you need to get out to people. Absolutely. Uh, we have the Residence Foundation Board, which is a board that's been in existence with all previous administrations, we are working, it's a two-pronged approach. It works on the First Lady's Initiative as well as the residents. And so right now we're focusing on the initiative. We had our first board meeting. We have people from all over the states, state because we wanted to make sure our perspective was statewide rather than just in one area. And we're obtaining information. We're working with partners. I'm packing food bags. I'm going to schools and having breakfast with the kids. It's uh, you know, an all gathering right now, but any time that someone wants to add in and give us information, we are receptive to it and we'll get it disseminated out there. You've been at this since 2012, but you haven't solved the problem. Right. You want to. Right. You'd like to put yourself yeah. out of business. So why is that? Is, is it just socioeconomic issues that happen everywhere? Or, or what, is, what is the great barriers to really attacking and solving the hunger problem in Wyoming? That's a great question, and I'm actually going to defer to you just because you've been out there. I have my own opinions, but I would love to know what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think it can be just about anything. As I was up in Gillette recently with Food Bank of the Rockies that was distributing food to the miners that had lost their jobs, and these were great paying jobs. These people, you know, were solid, were not worried about where their next meal was coming from suddenly they are and so i think it can happen at a moment's notice there are definitely uh, families that it's been cultural in their family mm. and they need maybe to have some uh, programs such as climb wyoming or programs that are, are involve workforce services so that they can get a higher paying job some one of the food bag recipients i met in sheridan was working 60 hours a week at three jobs and still not able to provide for a family because it's just expensive. So I think there's a, it's a multifaceted and I think it has to be multi-solutions. The first lady has shared what, what she thinks, Jamie. What, what do you think um, the issues, the, the high level issues are in Wyoming relative to hunger that really need to be thought about? I think that um, that what we're doing right now is is exactly what we need to be doing. Um, we need to work on more people accessing programs. There are quite a few programs out there. Um, we need to grow them, and the way that we do that is to get people involved financially and through volunteer hours. Um, I think the more people who have the ability to be involved get involved, the more people will be able to lift up, right? The rising tide lifts all boats. Um, if you're able to help get involved somehow. And um, the other piece of it I would say is think outside the box. Um, I think that sometimes it's easy to think like at Christmas when you drop money in the bucket and you're like, okay, I did my date, I'm good, right? Um, well, you didn't just solve world hunger. I mean, thank you so much for your donation. That's wonderful, but can you do more? And maybe all of us should just be asking ourselves, like, can we do more? And if we can, what is it that we can do? Mrs. Gordon, before we go, and we have a couple more minutes, um, you've also have come to learn about Partner With No Kid Hungry. What is that? No, Hit, no Kid Hungry is an organization that is nationwide. And I met with them when I was back in Washington, D D.C. And they are committed to reducing childhood hunger in the nation. So the grant that I wrote uh, with the, or we wrote with the um, Wyoming Department of Education is a grant with No Kid Hungry. And so they will come in, they will offer statistics, they will give you materials for media, they help you in every area to get that message across so people are aware. Jenny, as we wrap it up, of course, people can also donate to the Food for Thought Project. Right. And um, I think that you would encourage them to do that if they, because there are folks that can't come and pick in a garden or pack a food bag. Right. Um, you shared with me off camera some statistics, statistics that you saw when you first started in 2012. And they haven't necessarily gotten worse, but they haven't necessarily gotten better either, at least in Natrona County. Share with folks the need that really has extended over time. 
you asked me earlier about um, like spikes or did it seem to ebb and flow? And since we have been around, really, there have been about 3,000 kids in Natrona County continuously who have been identified as food insecure. And those are from multiple studies by the USDA, um, Food Bank or Feeding America and some other, um, No Kid Hungry has done some studies as well. And those numbers don't change. And so to us, that means it's not just a the economy's bad right now, so more people are hungry. It really comes back to the thing I keep harping on, that systemic issue. So you, you have to get involved. And I love this Wyoming Hunger Initiative because when kids go to school and they eat, their brains are ready to learn. You have an entire generation who now gets to take advantage of their education completely and fully. So you're gonna see test scores go up. You're gonna see graduation rates go up. You're gonna see kids more empowered as they're graduating and leaving school because they've been cared for from day one and not just by their parents which is obviously hugely important but by the entire community so they're they have this whole community of people feeding them and loving them and taking care of them so when they're ready to graduate off they go in a great positive way to contribute to the world and I think that in 12 years when this Wyoming hunger initiative has been around for that long and you have a generation of kids who have been fed and you have weekend food bags that are also taking care of kids on the weekend you're gonna see a dramatic shift but until that happens those numbers the 28,000 number of kids um, the 70 over 75 78,000 people living with um, hunger that's not going to change until we start until we start from the bottom I think Jamie you call yourself a trailblazer <laughs> but in that context you're not afraid to try maybe fail right and to readjust and I think that's an important message to people who want to maybe begin to make a difference aren't sure but you know what no one has the answer and the message is to try. Right. Absolutely. First Lady of the State of Wyoming, Jenny Gordon, thank you so much for sharing with us today, you know, your thoughts on this important initiative and Jamie Purcell for your work. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It's the work you do here, Jamie, is just wonderful and, and can be repeated elsewhere. Absolutely. In Absolutely. Wyoming. Thank you both for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.